Under the peak of Cerro Romaldo, in the Valley of the Bears, lies the 4,000-acre site of Camp San Luis Obispo, home of the California National Guard. During World War II, nine U.S. divisions, totaling over a quarter million men, were trained at this camp, and it has been pronounced one of the best military training areas in the United States. Along the Camino Real, the Royal Highway, marched the soldiers of Gaspar de Portola, laying a groundwork of friendliness for Father Junipero Serra to establish his fifth mission, San Luis Obispo de Tolosa, mission of St. Louis, Bishop of Toulouse, on September 1st, 1772. Almost 200 years later, the 49th Division of the California National Guard rolls into camp for the annual 1950 maneuvers to test under actual field conditions the lessons learned by the citizen soldiers during their armory training. An important task awaits the 49ers as they pass this monument, a tribute to the California Guardsmen of World War I. In the assembly hall, the men disembarking from the motor convoys are briefed on phases of the encampment. Promoting friendship, recreation, and social welfare among the first three grades, the Sergeant's Club provides entertainment and refreshments for the non-coms. Located near the center of the camp, the service club provides a center where the enlisted men may relax on off-duty hours and where they entertain their friends and relatives. In the all-denominational chapel in the camp, the chaplains hold services of every religion, Catholic, Protestant, and Jew, giving spiritual guidance regardless of creed. With emphasis on a good eye and speed, the medics relax between times with horseshoes. The medics, the most highly praised of the combat forces, the men who are too busy caring for the sick and wounded to shoot, spend spare time out stretching their muscles with these draft horse sized shoes. Hitting the pin from this distance shows a lot of time in the stretching of arms lifting litters under simulated battle conditions. recoilless rifle. This piece of ordnance is one of the most maneuverable of all. The men are taught through intensive training to deliver prompt and accurate fire on stationary or moving targets. The 75 millimeter recoilless rifle has a range of 7,200 yards with a maximum distance of five miles, is 82 inches long, and has a single shot breech loading system. Selected men who are precise and exact in their efforts and have the ability and sense to react quickly handle these rifles. The men on the 57 millimeter take the rifle through a dry run. When the general direction of fire has been designated, the men in the group rush the parts to the point of firing. Assembled, the aiming spots are coordinated and the azimuth, or arc with the horizon, is checked with the initial aiming point and the opening fire is made. The nature of the target, simulated, consists of a description of the enemy installation, personnel, equipment or activity which is observed. Fire for effect is the rule of these men. Preparatory marksmanship exercises have taught the guardsmen correct marksmanship when the range and deflection has been obtained. Each burst must count. There may be a change of direction and range between targets, necessitating a quick shift for the repelling of a larger group of personnel or equipment. The wingmen supply cover with carbons. The purpose of this demonstration is to explain and familiarize the gun crews with their functions and the overall action of an infantry division. During the armory training periods, the team has had instruction in the assembly of the rifle and is now showing its proficiency in the field. Adjustment of fire is started with a single piece. The longer range 75 millimeter recoilless rifle, after checking height of burst, the range and the deflection finds the target.
The Bazooka, immortalized by Bob Burns. The combat soldier of World War II, even though of small experience, learned to appreciate the hollow horn. Not a mortar, not a rifle, just a hollow tube with the firepower of a small artillery unit. The two-man unit was used as an on-the-spot armor disposer, as any infantry veteran will attest. This is the first time these men have fired the bazooka, and they're receiving instructions in the method of operation from a weapons specialist. When the gun is loaded, the assistant gunner signifies readiness by tapping the gunner on his helmet, and away it goes for a one-two punch. The chief advantage of the machine gun is the low silhouette and its surprise advantage when fired from a concealed position. In addition, the mobility of the weapon can make the difference between losing an advantage or retaining an initiative while heavier firepower is maneuvered for support of an offensive. The machine gun, with its paintbrush technique, immobilizes attacking infantry while heavier weapons dig in. The field artillery training program for units of the California National Guard is prepared and executed under the supervision of regular army instructors. Despite the fact that only two weeks are allotted every year for actual field problems, the intensive instruction at the annual encampment creates a feeling of realism in which the red legs by the sweat of their brow put into actual practice the things they've learned in their armory. The instructor teaches that successful solution of gunnery problems consists of coordination between the gun crew and a thorough knowledge of the operation of the breech block, telescopic sight, the elevating assembly, and other mechanical parts. One fact that every enemy in every war in which the armed forces of the United States have been engaged has been the belief that our huge and highly mechanized assault groups were, per se, slow-moving. With the refusal to look backwards and judge the present problems by that which went before or occurred in a previous battle, every battle problem becomes a new situation, and the officers and men, using their inherent initiative, react accordingly. The mobile artillery moves out to the range at Camp Hunter Liggett for firing practice. From the fire control center comes the designation and the laying of the pattern of shells in support of the individual assault troops. The primary purpose of an artillery unit is to occupy a position and open fire on the enemy in support of the action of the force of lesser ranged weapons, such as infantry, with their lower caliber weapons who are making the assault. The mission of the artillery plane is to carry out observations and the conduct of fire. On the plotting boards, the aiming points are determined from data supplied by observers to the fire direction center. And with a rapid calculation, the battery pieces are loaded and readied for the fire order. Successful operation of the 155 millimeter depends on the complete teamwork and coordination of the gun crew. The fire order is given. As soon as the battery position is occupied, the commander determines the maximum elevation and determines the over target range. Judging from the burst, he then determines the minimum range. The third shot will be on target. In the development of combat skill and excellence, 
A knowledge of elementary gunnery problems is necessary for the operation and adjustment of fire for the weapons. The training during the annual encampment gives the citizen soldier the hand-eye coordination that is emphasized for the success of gunnery problems. The plotting is relayed to the 105 millimeter gun. When the target area has been hit, the commander calls for the type of ammo necessary for target. A few set in the nose of each shell, which the personnel of the battery sets on the calibrated nose, determines when the explosion occurs. officer's first command is don't forget the person you serve. It doesn't have to be attractive, but it must be good to eat. So you get your ice cream on top of your mashed potatoes. With a flip of the wrist and a quick eating of the peas, you have a place for the dessert. You get dessert in this man's army. Anyway, you get a cool background for the refreshing pause. And a chance for a swim, if you have strength enough. With the earth for a chair and a rock for a table, or the good earth serving both purposes, an appetite worked up wrestling guns and ammo is satisfied in this peaceful area. It seems that some did have strength enough. And some, who are alert enough to remember the suits of cards, no, not canasta, this is blood poker for matches. For even the red leg, as Shakespeare said, sleep, which knits the raveled sleeve of care. In addition to his other duties, it's a cinch that any officer in any command will, if he lives long enough, become a mess officer. Any of the top brass can give you long and no doubt boring details of their times as mess officer. How they learned as corps, divisional, regimental, or long ago as platoon officer in charge of groceries, the headaches concerned with seeing that Private John Smith, that new and impressionable recruit, was supplied with fresh meat. In these days of economy, the courses in mess management for officers in the National Guard conducted at the food service schools show how the management and the logistics of food is handled. The competent mess officer and steward knows how to handle the cook, keep records, and to have a thorough knowledge and understanding of the principles of cookery. In addition, he must know how to purchase these tremendous amounts of food that he has dealt. Though in this case, he's not buying, for actual outlay of cash, he must nevertheless be sure that what is issued him is of the best. Each issue is broken down into a regimental brigade or company ration. The cook's worksheet keeps insisting on a change of daily menu for the men, whether in the field or in the barracks, so that it behooves the messmen, whether officer or non-com, to supervise closely the detailed preparation of food. Not only is the distribution of food important, but the assignment of personnel Many a good cook of known ability does not produce to his fullest capacity because he doesn't understand the logistics of military necessity. The regimental mess officer personally inspects the individual assignments for quality and quantity and checks with his aides on all rations received at the warehouse and the mess breakdown shed. The letter from home. There's nothing like the letter from home despite the fact that the guardsman is only away for a couple of weeks. After a day on the range or digging into a foxhole, even if there are no letters, a visit with a postmistress is worth the walk. 
Today is the day the eagle screams. Now here is one roll call that no one misses. The golden moment has arrived. Every recruit receives a total annual sum of $157.50, this including his annual encampment. Over a period of this same year, if you're a master sergeant, you can get $346.50 with added longevity, or fogey pay as it's called, commensurate with service. But it's all in American dollars. You're not only serving your state, but you're also serving your country and being paid for it. Today, even the colonel gets kidded by one of his enlisted men on how he's going to spend his pay. The tradition of the citizen service is older than the nation itself. The ability to defend oneself has come down from the Minutemen, who, when they ran out of ammunition, resorted to their fists. Now it's for fun, each man testing the other in friendly combat after the day's work is finished. The oversized gloves ensure that damage will be slight, for these men are interested primarily in developing their skill. The gentle art of self-defense, as practiced by these 49ers, shows the sportsmanship inherent in all state's guardsmen. Sport has always played a great part in the lives of Americans. The National Guard encourages the off-duty recreation of each man, whether he is skilled in a specific sport or not. And the too often neglected sport of volleyball provides fun for the new player, as well as teamwork and exercise for the more skilled. And speaking of sport, the beachhead gorilla, having received his first lesson in the Army Extension course in map reading, infantry, special text number four, tries a bit of reconnaissance with tentative approach sounding out possible contact. Mm. And of course, the inevitable record of the last assault. But there seems to be safety in numbers. Not pleased, but appeased, as what girl wouldn't be. A more serious business is the combat problem. Just a problem today. But tomorrow? The National Guard is always preparing for its vital role as guardian of America's security. The Guard with its infantry, artillery, engineers, armored units, and other component parts is a fighting force that will and has come to the defense of the nation when necessary. The mission of the Guard is to provide a reserve component for our armed forces, capable of immediate expansion to war strength and able to furnish units such as this 49th Division, fit for service, trained and equipped for combat in the defense of our country. In the National Guard, the citizen soldier becomes familiar with eight different weapons in addition to the basic rifle, the M1, such as the carbine, the Browning automatic rifle, light and heavy machine gun, bazooka, mortar, and recoilless rifle. The men on the walkie-talkies observing enemy operations and passing on the information received are the eyes and ears of the combat troops. Under fire, the infantryman has a difficult time even listening to messages when he is in action. The man who sees the battle and is capable of reporting an intelligible record to the command post is a valuable soldier. The mortar is a smooth bore, muzzle-loading, high-angle fire weapon. Consisting of three units, it is easily maneuverable, forming separate loads for three men, and light enough for each to transport to the point of fire, and, in certain instances, can take the place of artillery in immobilizing an advancing enemy. 
as witness the fire pattern and accuracy of these shell bursts. Whether it is a finger treated for anti-tetanus or a battle wound, the medics are in their pitching. Better equipped than forward area aid stations have ever been before, the medical battalion sees to it that the man injured in action is taken care of immediately. Based on the idea of the Army Medical Corps mobile surgical hospitals, which travel from point to point behind the division's front, the medics get the wounded to these bases. The 126th Medical Battalion, training as a unit, go through the combat problem rescuing the wounded and giving first aid and treatment under fire. Thanks to these men and the vast improvement in medical techniques, especially the logistics of military medicine, the injured receive quick and expert attention. After the injured man has been bound up and treated for shock, he is taken to the nearby medical base. The valuable training the men receive in the guard fits them for a similar role in civilian life as male nurses, medical technicians, and as industrial first aid men. And while they're learning, they have at hand the best of modern equipment and medical brains to instruct them. Following the adjutant's call, the officers and men to be decorated come forward to receive their decorations. Honored military guests watch the proceedings. Major O'Sullivan is the master of ceremonies and through the public address system keeps the guests informed. Major General Allard A. Walsh, President of the National Guard Association, presents medals to officers and men of the 49th Division for meritorious service. Distinguished officers representing all of the armed services occupy the reviewing stand as the mighty 49th passes in review. Leading the units of the 49th Infantry Division is Brigadier General Frank P. Delano, Commander of Troops, and the division staff officers. Before 4,000 guests and high-ranking officers of the Army, Navy, National Guard, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, the 49ers pass in review. In the line of march, passing in review, the following units of the 49th Infantry Division appear. The 49th Infantry Division Band. the 159th Infantry Regiment, the 185th Infantry Regiment, the 184th Infantry Regiment, The 49th Infantry Division Artillery. Six hundred thirty sixth Field Artillery Battalion. Six 
629th Field Artillery Battalion. One hundred sixty fourth Field Artillery Battalion. One hundred forty ninth Automatic Weapons Battalion. Six hundred thirty seventh Field Artillery Battalion. One hundred twenty sixth Medical Battalion. Division Special Troops. Five hundred seventy ninth Combat Engineers. The Provisional Battalion of Motorized Artillery. One hundred forty ninth Tank Battalion. And the forty ninth Reconnaissance Company. The 1950 annual encampment ends. To preserve the peace, we must be strong. The prime purpose of our military policy is the prevention of war. In our democracy, where the government is truly an agent of the people, the people themselves, these citizen soldiers, members of the 49th Division of the California National Guard, volunteering their time as well as their technical excellence, and competent leadership show that our most serious military problems will be solved.